Machine Obsessed Podcast. We'll be sitting down with a fresh guest each week. Someone who shares the same kayak fishing passion that runs through our veins. We're talking kayak anglers, kayak companies, lure experts. Heck, anyone who's got a story to tell about landing the big ones from a kayak. We're setting our sights on becoming the number one kayak fishing podcast in the world. You'll get a chuckle, a grin, and hey, maybe even a belly laugh. Because we believe in the power of humor. But above all, we're here to educate and inspire. So, whether you're a seasoned kayak angler or just dipping your toes into this exhilarating world, join us on the Kayak Fishing Obsessed Podcast. It's time to reel in adventure, camaraderie, and the joy of the catch. Here's your host, Darren Wendell. What's up, you fish freaks? Welcome to podcast episode number 56. If you love kayak fishing, fishing in general, especially bait making, tonight is going to be the show for you. The show tonight is brought to you by, well, the Wendell Fishing YouTube channel, sponsored by myself. Uh, if you have love kayak fishing, over a thousand videos, I put out daily shorts, daily community posts, weekly podcast here. And of course, at least one weekly video in the summer gets a little bit more. But um, a couple other things just to note, if you love kayak fishing, I have a channel, a group started over there on the old Facebook called Kayak Fishing Freaks. Tell you what, for those listening in live, I'm going to throw that link down there. Love for you to be a part of it. It was at zero like a month ago. We're already up at like 400. So I'm pretty pumped about that. I'd love to see you over there engaging. Remember, those of you who are joining us live, this is an interactive podcast. Hopefully, you've come to bring a bunch of questions that you have for Chris tonight. I will try to get them answered. And of course, I always love it when there's conversations taking place in the chat. Well, um, it has nothing to do with what we're talking about. So come here for community. Come here for camaraderie. But enough of that. 12 million views just on YouTube alone. 92,000 subscribers. Coming up on 100K, man. You're going to get your silver play button. Chris Jones from World's Worst Fishing. Bro, are you okay? I saw your boat. It wasn't in the water. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we had quite an experience this weekend. Uh, if, if you see me doing a lot of this tonight, ugh, you know, trying to stretch my body out. Um, yeah, it's because my neck hurts a little bit. Uh, the left left shoulder. Ugh. Yeah, there it is, guys. What happened? Um, yeah, what a what a time. Shout out, yeah, that's my wife and my father-in-law standing there in the back. <laughs> so, um yeah, so I'm I'm a wee bit uncomfortable, but hey, I walked away basically injury free. And um, yep, so now I'm now I'm starting the insurance uh battles to, to get the whole mess straightened out so um yeah that's never how you want your fishing trip to go but they don't call it the world's worst fishing for nothing so <laughs> hey uh, um, yeah so, cheers we are still alive and kicking so so for those of you listening in we're showing a photo of his z6 oof. nitro off his trailer next to a guardrail on the concrete it's kind of painful um it was very did, painful how'd that go down uh, so I'm cruising along, uh, just coming home from a trip um, where I missed 13 bites in a row. It was not my greatest performance. I, I got a lot of hit. I got a lot of bites, but missed a lot of bites. You know, so I'm already kind of feeling like, yeah, you know, that that wasn't, you know, could have had a better day. And then things got a lot worse. Uh, I'm driving along. All of a sudden, I have no control of my vehicle. I didn't know a thing. And wound up on the other side of the road facing the opposite direction. So I spun all the way around, trailer jackknifed, and threw the boat onto the sidewalk. Gosh. Um, so what happened was a minivan clipped a small SUV okay. that then collided actually with the boat and trailer itself. It had, so, so only the boat really was hit. And, you know, and, and when you're traveling fast, you know, in a 45, 50 mile an hour zone, once that trailer weight is thrown off, you lose control fast. Um, and uh, there was just nothing that could have been done. And um, yeah, here we are. So, well, glad you're all right. Yeah. For sure. um, yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, like I said, I'm going to kind of, I'll, I'll be doing this a lot tonight. But other than that, we're, 
we're, we're actually doing good. We've been, you know, working from home a little bit till the vehicle gets looked at minor damages to the truck. And, um, you know, we've, we've been out here making some baits, you know, whenever we can. So, yeah, there you go. Sly Fox <laughs> fishing says, uh, what a wild ride for sure. Uh, it, I... Yeah, it absolutely was. So, uh, I, am I able to see any comments that come through my YouTube stream of this? Yeah. Everything is all routed through. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. So yeah. Gotta... I'll have to look on here in a minute. So you're popular yeah. we're up to 110 live right now which uh, all right guys yeah last time you went to 110 so if if uh everyone's look watching in if you see me rub my neck it's not because i got a car accident it's because i have some hammocks for my kids and i was playing with them tonight and pulled a muscle in my back so i can barely like move so not yeah. as uh i understand that <laughs> 40 yeah. 42 yeah um, so yeah, yeah, 37 here, and I'm already feeling the aches and pains of adulthood. So oh man, yeah. it's it's rough. So six years. I was looking on your YouTube. Yeah. And, yeah. And I saw some of your initial videos. I had to scroll quite a bit because you're like 500 deep right now. Yeah, for, well, 400 and change at least. Yeah. There's, yeah. there's been a lot. Yeah. So what what got you because you started doing bait making videos kind of toward the beginning. Yeah fast catching videos and yeah. then you transitioned very quickly to bait making tell us the story why you got into it the story yeah so um being a soft bait youtuber was never the plan <laughs> um i <clears throat> you know just wanted to start doing youtube videos um you know well before like you know the whole googan thing happened you know i would watch um you know, I would watch Justin Rackley and, and his videos and, and, you know, back then he was doing much more, you know, actual fishing tutorials, more so than just entertainment vlogs. And so I, I really, you know, was drawn to some of his content um, on just trying to be a better angler, honestly. And I was like, you know what, I should set up a camera, you know, I'm, I'm not all that shy. So, you know, I, I have, you know, a lot of history of performing in front of people, just being a drummer, I, you know, I was even at the professional level, you know, early in my twenties and, uh, okay. you know, I've been just been playing drums in front of crowds. And, you know, I, I, I just said, Hey, you know what, if I can do that, I can turn the camera on and, you know, film myself fishing. Okay. So I actually just wanted to start your average fishing YouTube channel. And, um, I found out very quickly, I was just never going to compete with the channels that already had half a million subs and were able to dedicate full time to content creation. I mean, I was never just going to be a weekend warrior and go out there and catch enough fish to compete views wise. Um, and so I had this bait company, right? You can see this, oh, everything's backwards. The, <laughs> this logo right here, oh, Land yeah. of the Limit Soft Plastics. I had started that in the fall of 2012. Um, now how I got into that's a whole different story, but I had this bait company and I had, you know, a pretty good foundation on soft baits. Yeah. And I said, you know what, I'm going to film a video doing that. And I was actually color matching a Senko. That was my first ever bait video. If you go all the way back, my first ever soft bait video, I was matching a striking color called smoke and shad or smoky shad. Okay. And, uh, you know, it's it, just a two color laminate. Um, and I killed it, man. God, I got such a good match. Still have not gotten a good of a match. <laughs> Ever you know, since. As, as advanced as I've become, right? You know, I'm, I'm kind of known for being like the soft bait guru. Um, I've still never matched that color as good as that day. And that video immediately got to like 1,500 views in a couple of days. And I was like, whoa, yeah. like, there's a lot of potential there. And that was something that I could just do naturally. Um, I could sit there and make baits and talk about my process and just film what I'm doing from a first person perspective. If you watch a lot of my videos, I'm not the feature of it, you know, right. um, my processes and how to do this. It's more of an educational program, uh, that I think that I've built more than anything else. And so I was showing that first person perspective on how to do this and really digging in deep. Now, at that time, there were there was some soft bait making on YouTube. Um, that guy Skimpy was probably the only other channel that 
I would say was doing soft bait tutorials okay. um, in a much different style than I was doing. And I just, I kind of just saw potential for there to be a soft bait YouTuber um, that, that really nobody was filling. And I was like, okay, then that's my avenue for trying to do the YouTube thing. That's your niche, man. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it, 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 it almost was a complete accident. You know, I, I never intended to do it, but I made that first video and that first video outperformed all of my other videos combined. <laughs> um, you and, know I I like, oh, and I was like, okay, well, yeah, I can take a hint. You know, I'm not, I'm not the smartest guy, but I can take a hint. <laughs> and so that, that was sort that, you know, w within months that became almost exclusively what I did. Wow. So, you know, yeah. I've interviewed now, I think you're number 56. I don't think I've spoke to a single person where YouTube was the end goal starting off. Everyone always has stumbled into it. Just by yeah. accident. Like, well, you know, to yeah. So YouTube in general was my goal. Um, I, you know, I, I, I already had my bait company existing. Like I said, um, land is the limit. Soft plastics was founded in September, 2012. I believe my first video dropped December of 2016. I'm just going off my memory here. Yeah. Um, so several years later, and, and, and there was actually a two year period where I didn't make baits. Um, so, you know, there was sort of like a lapse in my bait company's history. Um, but when I started the world's first fishing YouTube channel, it had, it had nothing to do with baits. That's why it's called world's worst fishing. <laughs> like the name has nothing to do with baits. Yeah. Um, but by the time I established it, I, I wasn't going to change the name. Right. Um, that's, I mean, that this literally has nothing. I mean, yeah, I put the, I put we were making TV on my banner because that's ultimately what it became. But the name world's worst fishing was just meant to just be a catchy name. You know, yeah. um, like if, if I'm driving somewhere and I see a restaurant called world's worst restaurant or a <laughs> bar called world's worst drinking experience. I'm going to go there, you know? So it, it was just sort of a, um, just sort of a joke, honestly. <laughs> and, uh, and Hey, here we are. So. Yeah. I like it. I got some people yeah. chiming in. Um, yeah. 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 Hold, hold on guys. Know, let me, try, let me try to find some of the comments here. Parrothead said, what's in the cup, Chris? <laughs> Jeff Yoho. Uh, what's going on, buddy? Um, yeah, this is Costco brand. Canadian whiskey it is mm. crown Royal at a discount. And it's very good. Nice. So. Nothing but the best. Naughty old man says, oh my goodness, I love your videos. I don't even fish soft plastics. And this made me want to. Right on. Uh, well, hey, you know what? <clears throat> We're just getting started. You need to subscribe to the channel and you will be not only fishing soft plastics, you'll be making soft plastics within three or four months. It's going to happen. Brandon Motter said, love watching your bait making videos. Really inspired me to get in really getting into stuff, making his own, possibly making a business out of it. We're going to talk about that because yeah. you have a couple of videos on that. I didn't watch on purpose because I want to hear it straight from you. And then on the Williams, spot. let's do it. I yeah. will. Well, we're, we're, I'm, I'm excited to get there. Yeah. Nick Williams, father and son adventure says, Hey, I love what you do. You've inspired me to start Thanks, a business. Thank you. On my own. You. So wonderful. Wonderful. Let's hop, let's hop into it. Um, so yeah. walk us, I mean, let's start like from a beginner because here's here's me. I just I just got into this. every winter. I try to come up with something because I live in Ohio. It's freezing okay. up here. I can't yeah. fish. And so I was like, you know what? This is, I, I planned on this. this is going to be my year where I save all my broken soft plastics and start doing remills. And so I'm going on Facebook and I'm getting uh, this guy. Do you know what that is? Oh, that is the Bass Tackle Chatterbait Trailer Mold. Okay, I have I've made like forty of those so far, <laughs> and then this must be yep. Bass Tackle too. Maybe do you know which one that one is? Negative. I do not know that one All by right. name. Sorry, <laughs> there's there's too many. <laughs> yeah, I I'm surprised that you got one because I didn't know <laughs> since I got it on Facebook and I forgot to ask the, the guy. And nonetheless, I got, I mean, all the, the do it's the, the sand cast ones. And I've, yeah, I've probably okay. made, check this out. Yeah. I mean, like hundreds and hundreds of worms and In a great, frogs yeah. and chatterbait trailers. It's so great. I'm Jack and I'm sure I'm making a ridiculous amount of mistakes along the way. 
So let's start with me, right? Just getting into it. I'm probably two months into it. Got some molds for Christmas. Okay. I know I'm making mistakes left and right. And one, because I watched your videos. But what are some of the most common mistakes that beginners make? And we'll kind of, as the show goes on, we'll get a little bit more technical. Um, so hopefully you, yeah. for those listening in, you can pick up where you're sure. at in the bait making process. What are the most common mistakes? All right. So some of the most common mistakes that I see, and you can sort of divide this up between the injection world and the hand pouring world. A lot of the mistakes that I see are not so much the physical injection process. Okay. Um, it's a lot to do with color. Um, I would say the I, I would say the average person who does enough homework, watches enough of my videos, that gains enough confidence to start bait making, has. 10 times the foundation that I did when I started. When I started, there was no world's worst fishing. Um, <laughs> I, this was, this whole hobby was an informational black hole. Okay. When, when I bought my first molds and injectors, the website I bought them from didn't even have pictures of them. Like I, I didn't even know what I was buying. Um, you know, so for example, this is your standard single color injector. Okay. Yeah. And basically this is just a giant aluminum syringe. Yeah. And, I didn't even know what it was going to look like when I bought it. Um, and so I, I, I would say the average person now has the tools and the knowledge and the, 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 the I won't say disposal. Um, I, I guess the access to information that they're not starting completely in the dark. Okay. So a lot of the mistakes that I made, people weren't making anymore because they are so much better informed. There's so many resources now available from my channel, from Facebook groups, um, even old school forums. Sure. Um, so I, I would say a lot of the mistakes that I see are basically color mistakes. Everybody wants to dump a ton of color and a ton of glitter in there, and they're just oversaturating everything, and their worm comes out looking like a crayon. You know, it, it mm -hmm. doesn't have any vibe. Um, and then I would say process wise in terms of physically how to do this. <laughs> um, like these. <laughs> yeah. I, I would say people run into a lot of trouble with, with understanding viscosities and temperature control when they're trying to shoot two color laminates. Um, laminates are very difficult, I'll say. Um, and to really master it, you have to learn each mold. Um, some injection molds laminate very easily because of their configuration and because maybe the cavity is, um, you know, more simple, but then a more asymmetrical cavity, um, can be, can be more difficult. So, you know, and, and then there, there, there's always the issues of just learning how to cook the plastic. Um, a lot of people will make the rookie mistake of not mixing their raw plastisol enough. Okay. or not cooking it properly. So what people have to realize is whenever you are cooking a Pyrex cup full of plastic, whether it's the little cup or the big cup, right? Let's say I filled this up with, with liquid plastisol and you microwave it. That microwave is cooking the plastisol from the top down, okay? Mm -hmm. So whenever I take that plastic out of the microwave, the bottom contents of the cup are going to be less cooked than the top. And so liquid plastisol has to reach an internal temperature of 350 degrees Fahrenheit for it to chemically convert from its milky phase through the gel phase all the way up to workable phase, okay? So you're, you're actually causing a chemical reaction. Um, and because of that, we have to pay excise tax. But however, um, really? what, yeah, what you're doing <laughs> is you're actually chemically converting a polyvinyl chloride compound. And so what people make the mistake of is cooking their plastic and they take a surface temperature on the top right? or, or they're not temping the bottom. And so what happens is the bottom contents of the cup will still be in what we call gel phase, which it, I mean, literally it's called gel phase because it's like jelly. That's not workable plastic. Your baits are never going to set up. They're not going to cure. They're going to be sticky and gooey. And so you have to really um, 
if, if I can just demonstrate here real quick. Yeah, go for it. Whenever you pull a, a cooked cup of plastic out, you have to stir up the bottom contents and then reheat. Okay, so your cooking process is almost never done at once. You're going to take it out of your microwave over here. You're going to stir up the plastic really well. The idea being to get the uncooked contents stirred into the plastic. Okay, that way you're now cooking the entire contents of the cup more effectively and more evenly. And then that way your plastisol works. So I would say people don't prepare their plastic correctly, which can start with the initial mixing of the, of the material and then the cooking. I think cooking the plastic and understanding how it has to convert is where people go wrong in terms of process, in terms of color. Well, real quick, before we have yeah. color, I got a couple yeah. questions here. Um, so what are the increments? that you typically will throw it in the microwave. Cause everyone's like, Oh, I got to get this thing up the, the tap. Right. I'm just going to go yeah. straight four minutes without mixing it. And yeah. then you end up, then yeah. what happens if you do that? And second question, yeah. what happens if you don't, you said it doesn't set up correctly. What does mm -hmm. that mean? Like when you're pouring your baits, like what, right. what will okay. your end result right. be? So um, <clears throat> for example, this is the one cup size Pyrex a cup. Okay. Yep. Now there are different size Pyrex cups and they all require different cook times in your microwave, okay? And so your cook time depends on the size of the cup, the wattage of your microwave, and the durometer of the plastic. So even the different plastics that we have, you just kind of have to practice. <laughs> you know, you have to learn how long to cook something. So I know just from my personal experience, if I fill up this cup all the way to the one cup line, this microwave right here being 700 watts, I need exactly two minutes and 30 seconds. Okay? You got it dialed in, man. <laughs> yep. And that, and that will cook the plastic clear all the way to about this line. Okay. The, the remaining contents down here are still going to be a little bit milky. And that's that gel phase. It's not through gel phase. Okay. So I will then take it out of the microwave, stir up that bottom a little bit. Okay. And then I'll reheat for 25 to 30 seconds. After that, my plastic is done. Now, however, if I'm if I'm cooking a bigger size cup, let me try to find a size cup. All right, so here's the bigger size cup. This yeah. one is two measuring cups worth of volume. Okay, this one's full. I need four minutes and thirty seconds. Okay, and that's going to give me the same result. I'm not going to overcook it. I'm not going to burn it. I'm actually slightly undercooking it. That way. I'm not degrading the resins. Okay. So when you over, when you overcook plastic, you're actually hurting the plastisol's integrity. Okay? okay. What you never want to do is, is, is basically overcook it because then your resin will turn yellow and you'll get discoloration. And so I'm actually, all of my cook times are actually designed to undercook it slightly. Okay. And then I will stir up the bottom of the contents. Okay and then do that little slow incremental reheat to where everything is now cooked, okay? And then you can obviously take your internal temperature probe, sort of like a meat probe, yeah. like you're cooking, you know, chicken, Digital and uh, and just right. make sure make sure that the very bottom is reading 350, because if the bottom's 350, the rest of it's 350. And then you will not have problems. Whether you're hand pouring or injecting, that is fully chemically converted plastic, and it will set up, it will not be tacky, it will not be gooey, it will not be runny, and you're gonna get the, the correct firmness and action out of the bait. What happens is if you don't mix the plastic enough, yeah, right before you cook it, now your plasticizer to resin ratio is off, and your plastic's not gonna be the the the, the correct firmness. Okay. What, okay. well, we call it durometer, but for just layman's term. You have like really soft plastics, you know, medium, medium, hard, hard. In order to maintain that, you have to mix the material and cook it properly. So that's sort of like a crash course in some of the, you know, I, well, I guess the whole point was what mistakes do I see? The mistakes I see are improper um, prep of the plastic, yeah. which normally comes from cooking and it's not hard, you know, like, okay, yeah, I just got to get it three, 350. How hard can that be? It's just all about practice and refining your processes. You got to learn your cups. You got to learn your microwave. You got to learn your plastic. 
go through that, make those mistakes. You know, you're, you're going to take it out and it's going to be completely black. It's going to be burned. You know, you're, you're going to make those mistakes, but that's okay because that has to happen in order for you to refine your process. And then comes, you know, the issue of color and color is subjective, but there are some pretty fundamental mistakes that a lot of uh, rookies or in, uh, you know, new bait makers make, and, and they're just putting way too much color, way too much glitter in there. And they're actually not getting the most out of their colors. Um, okay. Yeah. So we, you know, we can talk about that if you want. Well, but... I still want to go back to some of the, the prep stuff because, yes. yeah. um, um, just a couple of questions. Sure. When it comes to when, when you, and now you mentioned different plastics, all mm -hmm. different temperatures, mm -hmm. typically, when do you know you burnt one? Is it a certain temperature? Like, okay, I went you'll 365. Know. Or what, you'll know, like... Right. So, so I I use a plastisol called Dead on Plastics. Uh, oh, yeah. It's all over your... It's all over yep, your... Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. So, de Dead on Plastics, um, you know, they kind of have their founding by bait makers, okay? So, for the longest time, a lot of the lure plastisols available to the market were polymers companies that were offering lure plastisols and lure plastisol is basically flexible pvc resin polyvinyl chloride and plasticizer oils okay and so it's all about the ratio of resin to plasticizer and dead on plastics you know the the, the founder of dead on plastics was actually travis crossman who was a bait maker for 13 years um and and i don't mean just any bait maker i mean high-end well sought after i mean had accounts with tackle warehouse all that kind of thing okay and then the owner of ai molds okay so you you had two people well established and well seasoned in the home bait making industry mm -hmm. that started dead on plastics and and they have created this plastisol to be for the bait maker by the bait maker okay and so it has really good reheatability okay so one of the things that you need in a good plastisol as a home bait maker is you need the ability to be able to reheat it several times okay we're not running you know five five uh, 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 uh 55 gallon drums of plastic at once on, on a huge injection machine where the plastic only gets cooked once you know where we're doing two, three cups at a time, sometimes a gallon at a time, if you own like a shooting star, two gallons at a time. And a lot of times we're recycling our materials. Okay. Right. And so we need to be able to abuse it in the microwave and it not turn yellow. So whenever you do overcook your plastic, it will turn yellow. If you burn it, it turns black and put that cup outside. Do not breathe in those fumes. <laughs> Car yeah. Carcinogenic. Nasty um, stuff. Yeah. So like, you'll know if you do it, you like, you'll, you'll know if you burn it. Um, but you got to get pretty up there. Like you, you've got to approach 400 degrees, um, for, for this stuff to start burning. Now, got some, it. some of the plastisols I've used in the past 370 and they're toast, you know, oh, so not, right. not every plastisol has the type of heat stabilizers in it that you need, but different plastisols are made for different things. <clears throat> so for example, if you go buy a bag of baits off the shelf at the store, that's actually pretty cheap plastic, but it doesn't need to be the high end stuff with, <clears throat> you know, lots of expensive um, plasticizers and, and better resin and better heat stabilizers because it's going through a heat exchanger once before it goes into an ejection machine and it's never reheated again. So it only needs to withstand one heat cycle as to where us in our garages with our microwaves, we need a plastisol compound that can really go through the motions. I mean, you know, we're reheating this stuff 10 times before it's, before it's bad. <clears throat> and that's honestly what you have to have. All right. So oh, man. that, those are my thoughts on that. Bring in the juice guys. We have 160 people on live right now. I'm pretty What's excited going on, guys? about that. Yeah. Right now. Uh, yeah. Let's see some of the comments. Hey, over please, here. please ask questions. Uh, Milk me here? for all I'm worth. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, cool led AP 120. So I got my pen and paper going, guys. This is school time. I love it. Yeah. Uh, here's a question I got because okay. I make a bunch of Senkos. Of course, I have the Senko mold from Do It Molds. Yeah. Um, Yama Senko, yeah. How much salt do you need per cup of Plastisol to be like a Yamamoto Senko? Okay. So and is it floured salt or what do you what do you do? 
Right. So um, you can buy salt from the lure manufacturers, you know, like, uh, you know, Spike It Lure Works. Uh, you can buy salt from pretty much anywhere. I like fine flake salt from Lure Works, um, which is a bait supply company. Um, however, <clears throat> you can really use any salt you want. And I have sort of a love hate relationship with salt when it comes to, to bait making. It, it causes a lot of problems. Okay. But if you really want to make a Cinco that just has that really heavy, dense feeling, um, you know, you kind of have to have it. Even even if you're using these sinking blends from Dead On Plastics, if if you want to get that Yamamoto feeling, you have to have salt. So what I always tell people is <clears throat> you're going to need worm blend plastic from Dead On Plastics, okay, which is a soft durometer. If there's one thing we know about the Yamamoto Cinco's is that they're soft. I mean, it's, I mean, this stuff is like gummy worm plastic. You can cast once and the bait rips off and you don't, you know, there goes a dollar 50. Um, so my advice cents. would be, I've yeah, done the math. yeah, it's painful. Right. Yeah. You know, they, they are weak and overpriced, but they are undefeated when it comes to getting bites. Mm. Um, so my whole thing is you use a good worm plastic. Um, now, if you're not using dental plastics, that would just be whatever the soft durometer is. Okay. I don't recommend using finesse plastic for a Cinco. I think a Cinco is just a little bit too thick of a bait for finesse blends. Um, I just, I, I, I think they're just going to be just pfft, limp. Um, so worm plastic. And then in terms of salt, I like a quarter cup. Holy cow. For one cup. Okay. So, Dang. so let's, let's say I fill this one cup, uh, Pyrex cup all the way up to the one cup line, all the way to right there. Okay. I want to then take out a quarter cup measuring spoon, fill that up with salt and dump it into that one cup. Okay. So whatever that comes out to be mathematically, it's a lot of salt per yeah. one cup, a quarter cup of salt per one cup of volume of, of plastic. And, you know, you, you, you always, <clears throat> excuse me, you always run into moisture problems because salt holds moisture. It attracts moisture and moisture in an oil, never a good thing, right? Like you never put out a grease fire with water. So when you have a hot oil-based plastisol and then you dump salt into it, Boom, you're going to get bubbles galore, and yeah. you just have to do the best you can. Stir slowly, try to work the bubbles out, and then and then you're, I, I, I guess the next fight that you're fighting is salt suspension. The salt sinks very fast, and so right before you shoot those baits, you got to really stir it up, really get yeah. that salt suspended, and then run your baits, and then you'll be just fine. Um, that has always given me my, my best Cinco uh, – feel um you know however these days i just run straight swim bait blend actually in the dental plastic sinking blend and i i just throw them without salt but all right um but however if you're looking for that just really limp soft salty uh cinco feel um i i i, I would start with that and and see if you can dial it in how you really want it yeah I mean, I got some guys over here saying how they put salt in the oven, kind of pull the humidity yep. out of it. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. You, you can bake it. You can put it in a dehumidifier. Uh, you can do a lot of things. Um, I rather just let the bubbles work out, you know. I mean, put put the salt in. If it bubbles, stir slowly. Let the bubbles rise. In, in 10 minutes, you're ready to go. I, I don't want, me personally, I do not like working with salt enough to go put it in the oven. <laughs> just, I'm going to run it and deal with it and make my baits. So. Do they damage your injectors at all over time? No. All right. Um, all right. How, however, there are other sinking additives that are silica based and sand based that can damage the, the interior finish of your injector. And so I do not recommend any of that, especially and. like just straight sand. Um, don't do it. I, I did it once on video, just kind of as a goof. Um, I don't recommend it. All right, right on. Now you mentioned all these different types of plasticizers, mm -hmm. um, and I've seen them advertised as soft, medium, yeah. hard plasticizers. You're making 
you're saying we're imposticizers. It gets it sounds like bait specific. Walk mm -hmm. us through because that that could be confusing for a new bait maker coming on the scene. Like, yeah, what, what should I buy? What the what the crap's going on? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, when I started, there were not near as many options to market as there is nowadays. Right. So you can get really overwhelmed overwhelmed real quick. Um, you know, you're you're like, oh my god, like, do I need the three and a half inch ecto crawl or the four inch ecto crawl? Do I need the three cavity or the four cavity? One one of the main questions I get in dms and youtube comments is hey hey do you do you think i can fill these two molds with this size injector or what size injector do i need if i have the atomic toad mold and <laughs> i don't know people um you know it's it's literally one of those things by the biggest volume injector that you can afford yeah. because you're never going to wish that you had a smaller injector um yeah, I that, got a six ounce and I'm like, okay, I yeah, need the Mondo, I need the Mondo that you got. Dude, I've got two Mondos and Show, now I have that Mondo over here. And no, uh, oh, I can go get it. Yeah, and get it. nobody has seen this yet. I now have the Mondo dual injector. Let me, uh, yeah, let me, we, we but, have to see it. <laughs> <laughs> got some comments. I see Naughty Old Man and Eric Pace. Thank you guys. You guys were giving, <gasps> whoa, check it out. Yeah. Yeah, Jeez. this is a 32 ouncer and uh, it means business. I mean, you could, <laughs> I could, I could throw this through a wall. Um, Looks like yeah, an old, so. old timey Gatling gun, to be honest with you. Yeah, it, it, <laughs> it, it, this thing is insane. Um, so, 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 yeah, you know, I, I, I would say in terms of your plastic, it's all about whatever your target bait is. Okay. So, if you're wanting to make big swim baits, you need a medium hard to hard barometer. Okay. Mm. You're, you're talking about a big, thick piece of plastic, you know, some, something this big or even much bigger. Um, you cannot go soft on a big bait. If you're making ice fishing lures, go finesse blend or, or, a, or, a, or, or soft blend like worm blend. Um, if you're just making like, you're just kind of right down the middle, you know, Crawls, creature baits. Um, I mean, golly, what else can you put in there? Lizards, um, even 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 certain cinco's and worms. Go with a medium durometer, which, in dead on plastics terminology, is swim bait blend. Um, it's it's all about what your target bait is. So so for example, my ten inch ribbon tail worms. I use craw tube blend, which is a medium hard durometer. You would not think that you would want to use that for a soft worm, right? But however, a 10 inch ribbon tail is big. It's big. And if there's one thing you know about a big worm, a lot of bass pull the tails, right? They short strike it and you're going to set the hook and the bass maybe only had it by the tail. You don't want that tail to just immediately rip and then your worm's ruined, right? I, I find that a big worm, I get the action that I want. And the durability out of that I want out of a medium hard durometer. However, right, a seven and a half inch ribbon tail worm, I'm going to run a medium durometer. Okay. So okay. I'm going to get a little bit more wiggle out of that worm without sacrificing much of the durability because it's a smaller worm. And any strike from a fish on that worm is likely to result in a hook set and not a, a ripped tail. So a lot of it comes down to whatever your target bait is. So for okay. example, my swim baits, I usually toggle between the swim bait blend, which is medium barometer, and the craw tube blend, which is medium hard. Um, whether I'm pouring a little four inch open pour swim bait or the big, you know, seven and a quarter inch, I'm only using those two blends. If I want to pour a four and a half inch finesse worm, I'm not using worm plastic. I'm not using finesse plastic. I'm using a medium barometer. And that just a lot of it is subjective. Um, there's not really a wrong answer, but but I, I think the only way that you can go wrong is to is to try to make a big bait in in too soft of a plastic. I'd much rather have a small bait made out of plastic that's too firm than a big bait made out of plastic that just can't get the job done and it's just gonna tear apart. So All right. Yeah. Yeah, this is, it's for those listening and are like, I'm going to have to watch this like four times over just to absorb. 
all the juice you're sharing tonight. So hey, thank dude, you for that. like honestly, DM me. Like if you ever have questions, really, my Instagram DMs are a 24 seven help desk. It never stops. What? Ever. That's ever, awesome. Ever, ever, never, never, never. So I will, <laughs> I will wake up in the morning and I will have messages that somebody sent me at 3 a.m. in a different time zone somewhere. And I'm like, uh, so uh. that's awesome <laughs> that you, you get out there and you're answering those guys. We're at mm -hmm. 180 people live right now. If you haven't done so, please hit that like button. It'll help get this video a little bit extra yeah. on the YouTubes after the live is over. Yeah. I've got a question for you. When we talk some molds, right? There's all kinds of molds out there. You got your sandcast aluminum, your stone, your CNC aluminum, your silicone molds. I'm sure there's probably some I'm not even aware of. Starting off, when do you use one over the other? Got to give pros and cons to those, especially yeah. for someone like me. So if you just want to start with injection, um, sandcast molds are great. I, I will never, ever, ever ever recommend stone molds okay. um, i think they are absolute garbage <laughs> and you know what I, I you know the, the other downside to stone molds is the places that you buy stone molds they're overseas and they're knocking off like production baits so like you can buy an exact rage crawl you can buy an exact bandito bug an exact sweet beaver you know um you can buy an exact horny toad and, and so my, my whole thing is, look, if you're if you're interested in being your a, a custom bait maker, whether you want to sell baits or you just want to make your own stuff because you think you can do it better. Don't buy a mold of something that already exists that 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 defeats the whole purpose of doing it yourself. Mm. And then the stone molds, you know, they, they stick, they can warp, they, they require mold release. Um, they're just a big pain in the butt. So. I, I would I would confidently say go the sand, the sand casted aluminum do it molds right the do it essential series essential molds series. right if you're just a little hesitant but you're curious okay however if you know that you're more than curious go CNC aluminum don't don't even give yourself the headache of sand casted molds because sand casted molds they are vented poorly the details are a little poor and you and you get a dull finish to the bait yeah, however a dull finish to the bait has nothing to do with if, if it'll catch a fish has nothing to do with the quality of the bait it just looks lesser than what you're already buying at the stores sure. and so to to me it just kind of comes back to the okay well why do you want to make your own stuff you want to make your own stuff because you want the thrill of making something that you can't go buy, right? Mm -hmm. That is why that is why we all started is, you know what? I've always wanted a fluke in this color, but Zoom doesn't make it, right? Yeah. And so boom, the light go the light bulb goes off. The last thing you want is a fluke mold that sucks. So um I would say, I would say, look, if you're really serious, start with quality molds. Get CNC aluminum. There is no other alternative. Mm. That is for injection. Okay. okay. So if you are interested in open pouring, hand pouring, okay. So, and, and, and for those who know nothing about this hobby, let me show you the difference. Okay. This is an injection mold. Okay. And as you see, it has a giant hole in it. This is called the port or um, as we call it sometimes the sprue. Okay. So if we open this mold up, this is, this is essentially what everyone knows is like a brush hog okay so this is the ai crazy hog mold okay so you can see that there are four of them this is a four cavity mold okay and so what's really cool about injection is you get instant results instant gratification okay so you will take your injector you will draw up the plastic you will insert the injector okay right there into the top of the mold and you will basically push the plastic down, which will fill in all four cavities, okay? All right. And just for some more nomenclature, this part down the middle is called the runner, okay? I thought the whole thing so, was a sprue. Yeah, so that is an injection mold, okay? And that is a very high quality CNC injection mold. I mean, something like this runs about $200 and it's worth every penny because once you buy it, you got it. 
There's no depreciation whatsoever. This will not wear out. It will not stop working. It, it's, it's not like a car where you drive it off the lot and it's worth nothing. And resale um, on these things. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Value. I, I, I could sell that for 95% of what I bought it for. Yep. Um, this, however, is an open pour mold. Okay. Right. We see that there's no injection port. What's going on? There's no runner. You know, we open it up and it literally just looks like half a swim bait. <laughs> That's what it is. Okay. So this is a lot of what I do nowadays. This is a hand pour mold, an open pour swim bait mold. All right. So. If you are interested in hand pouring, silicone molds to me are the way to start. Okay. okay. You can you can get great silicone molds um, from actually small garage bait makers like me who are now making silicone molds of baits to sell. Um, okay. So for example, let's see if I can get over here. You're working on an octopus I saw on your channel. Is that what you're gonna show us? Oh well, no. Yeah, that, that's an old marling bait. So um in, in, in ter okay, so in terms of who's selling silicone molds, right? You, you know, like this is a little goby mold right here. This is like a little uh, drop shot, you know, kind of darter worm mold. Um, you know, these are all from a buddy of mine named Noah, you know, who runs a company called Slims. And these are all, you know, homemade silicone molds from small timers like me in their garage. Um, and silicone molds are the gateway to hand pouring, okay? Because this is this is all a single cavity open pour. So I am literally taking my plastic and just pouring it in here, and then and then hey, I have this crawfish, okay? Yeah. Right? And and these are cheap, thirty dollars a mold, some sometimes even less. And, and you can get swim bait molds. Um, there's there's really no limits, and so that is sort of your gateway price point to hand pouring. And then if you really want to take it to the next level where you have full creative capability and you can really use preheated molds for thermal blending, thermal bonding, you know, hey, you, you go CNC aluminum. So it kind of all what it kind of all comes back to CNC aluminum, I think, at the highest end. Um, I can think of one hand pouring bait maker who has made his whole career out of pouring out of silicone molds no, who don't. is considered you know top echelon and, and that that that's probably paul crew custom lures um and then uh brad hardy with oracle lures and then across the pond um there, there's a guy named uh i don't i don't know his name but tommy's baits tommy's baits t-o-m-y-s okay. um you know he he's actually molding real fish and then making silicone molds of molded fish and then he paints them with an airbrush so a very different style of bait making i you know i, I like the whole hand pouring thing where i'm trying to create a pattern with plastisol other yeah. people prefer to do it with an airbrush which you know allows you even more color layering and you know stencils and some details that you can't really do with plastic but there's nothing quite like the 3D effect that you get with true layered hand pouring. So sure. it, it, it's it's kind of all it's kind of all what you want to focus your your time and energy on. Your stuff is sick. Your Instagram, all that layered stuff that you do is like wow. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Just, yeah, it's um, wow. yeah, it's a labor of love. I I'd have to take the. I'd have to take the phone down and flip the camera around to, to show you guys a bunch of work. But yeah, I, I have a bunch of stuff in here. So. <laughs> so a couple of questions for you here. Yeah. Uh, coming in from the audience listening in. We yeah, hit, please. We, we hit 200, by the way, in live, which is exciting. Uh, I, <laughs> from Bass Raft. I love this because the answer is it never does, um, in my opinion. At what point does it become cheaper to pour your own baits? Right. Never. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Well, so it's like anything else in life. How <clears throat> strong-willed are you? Um, look, if you just want to replace how many Cinco's you go through or how many frogs you go through and you want to go buy a mold that will essentially make the same bait mm -hmm. and you stick to just remelting, okay? Yep. Eventually that plastic's going to burn, you know, it is, it is like, what, let's say you're just remelting strike Kings or remelting zooms or remelting Guggen's. You're going to get just a few remelts out of that. Eventually that plastic is going to burn. It's going to scorch. 
It is not loaded up with heat stabilizers. It has very cheap resins. Mm. So eventually you're going to get to a point where you now need to buy some real plastisol or raw plastisol, and then you're going to need the colors. You're going to need the glitters, all of that. Oh, yeah. But hey, oh, yeah. you already have the mold. You already have the injector, right? You maybe spend a hundred bucks between your do it mold and, and a, a single injector. You're not out much money. What happens is you're going to start being, you're going to start making your own colors and be like, oh man, I just made this color in this frog over here, the Cinco over here. I wonder if I could make it in a lizard, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. or, 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 or a craw or a swim bait or something. And then you're going to want, you're going to want that lizard mold, right? You're going to, you're going to want this mold. You're going to want this mold. And so eventually you won't be buying any soft plastics at all anymore off the shelf. No. And so you're saving money on that, but you're also buying molds and plastic, you know, plastic is really your biggest expense. I think molds can be more expensive than plastic in terms of just a single purchase. Sure. But once you buy a mold, you got it. It's there. It's done. As long as you don't drop it and it bends to where it won't, to where the tolerances are now off and it won't marry up together. Um, as, as long as you don't break the mold, it's going to work pretty much forever. I have molds and injectors from 2012 right now Got it. that are not slowing down one bit, right? <laughs> I'm getting older, but they're staying the same. Yeah. So your biggest expense is your non-renewable resources, right? Your colors, glitters, and plastic, but it's really plastic. So if you're one of the few people on this planet who can limit the amount of molds that you need to purchase, and the amount of different colors and fancy powders, I I think it actually does give you a really good return on your investment. I mean, one gallon of plastic, I think I once got over 400 seven-inch ribbon tail worms out of Dang. it. Dang. So that is one gallon of plastic. That is $30, maybe 45 by the time it's shipped. You know, shipping on a heavy liquid is, is not cheap. Right. So, you know, $45 worth of plastic. They were all one color, so one four ounce bottle of color is five or six dollars, you know, and and maybe a few glitters, which are nothing. Yeah. Um, four hundred worms, you know. Hey, I'll go. I'll go through five hundred cinco's in a second. Yeah, go go buy five hundred cinco's right now and tell me that it costs less than forty five dollars. So nope. You know it 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 really depends on if you want to make a little bit of everything or a lot of one thing. Yeah. And you, you know, know the beauty of it also going into it, you're like, Hey, I'm going to get into it. I'm going to buy some nice molds. Like we yeah. said earlier, if you want to get out of it, you can, because you can turn around and sell these things at 95%. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, 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 they do. I'm telling you, man, they, they hold their value like, like a nice wristwatch, you know, they, they, they do not d depreciate very much. So, um, you know, you, you, you actually can exit the hobby with minimal loss. You know, your, your plastic has mm -hmm. good value. Um, your molds have excellent value. Yeah. Glitters and colors. Those weren't expensive to start with. So don't expect much there. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it, 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 it really is a very fulfilling hobby. So even if it turns out that you're not saving money and likely maybe you won't, um, I think the return is much better than anything that can be measured on just a cost spreadsheet. Sure. Here's my, here's the return I want when I when I want to make mine. I was like, how yeah. freaking awesome would it be to make my own lore and my own custom color and mm -hmm. then slay on it? Like the, it's now full circle, right? Mm -hmm. From mm -hmm. my idea of the color, the mixture, to the presentation, to the retrieve, yeah. to the bass, to the photo, to the tournament board. I mean, that mm -hmm. <laughs> like I can't wait. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you 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 essentially get to be your own research and development lure department. Um you know, now, 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 obviously, if you just want to go extreme, you know, you, you can have your own custom mold made. I mean, hey, start writing down little designs on a napkin and a piece of paper. And hey, if you really like what you have, you can have your own custom mold made and, and you know, sign a, you know, non-disclosure agreement with the mold cutter, you know, with, with the CNC, uh, you know, machinist. And, yeah, you know, I, I, I have two custom molds that nobody else in the world has. Um, you know, that, that, that's really fun. However, it's really not necessary anymore. 
Sure. There, there are so many great molds available now to market. Um, going custom to me is more just for novelty nowadays rather than necessity. You know, when, when I started, it was a big necessity. Mm. There was there there were no good frogs, none. There was not a good frog. There was not a good little paddle tail swim bait. Um, none of that. So I sought custom molds for that, right? Um, nowadays, anything you want, you you can have it. And yes, that means other people can have it. You know, so you're not necessarily offering something that no one else is. But that's only if you're worried about selling, you know, and, and if you're trying to approach this as a business, your main focus should not be, do I have a mold that no one else has? Your main focus should be, do I know how to sell? And am I, am I any good at this? Right. Mm. you like practice, learn, you know, a, a, a pro, I, I always say approach this like you're learning an instrument, daily practice, daily dedication, study who you consider to be the masters and what are they doing? Mm. How are they building color? How are they interpreting color? And really focus on refining your process because time is money. Yeah. And, you know, that's a whole nother rabbit hole to go down is how to be successful at this in business. And my story is, is going to be different than most people. Yeah. You know, not, not everybody got in early on the soft bait YouTube thing and, and build a customer base out of that. You know, it, it seems completely counterproductive, but the success of my bait company can be attributed to my YouTube channel success where I taught everyone else how to make baits. So sure. I, you, you would think, okay, so you taught everyone how to make your product, but you're still able to sell it. I got right? people in the comments asking where to buy it. DM me on Instagram. That there is where go, I sell my baits. Yes. There it is. Yeah. Got that, but, got that answer. but, but, but I will say I am, I am 95% selling my swim baits only, you know, like if, if you, if you DM me and you ask for one bag of 10 crawls, I'm sorry, like you're, you're out of luck. You know, like uh, one, one, by the time I mix up color and plastic to make seven frogs, I've, I've lost money at that point. Um, just, just in terms of what I can make selling some of my more high end stuff. So that's, yeah. that's not to diminish people who sell frogs. It's just, what I'm choosing to focus my time on in terms of sales. So like if yeah. anyone is, you know, interested in like a really unique set of swim baits or, you know, maybe, maybe some really great worms or something that they cannot buy in a store. I think I'm a pretty good option. So yeah. Heck yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, well we, we try to be, so I've, <laughs> I've got, hundreds of swim baits that need to be mailed out. So I, I'm, I'm a little behind and now I don't have now Now I don't have my truck right now. So I'm, I'm a little, I'm a little hesitant to drive to the post office um, until my truck gets assessed. So, Ugh. yeah, still, I know, problem. man. Yeah. Um, I guess. Become, yeah. So do we have any it. more questions? Oh, we, got questions. we got a ton of questions. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you a choose your own adventure on questions. So I'm going to shoot you like three, you pick one to answer. Um, should I add softener to my baits? That's number one. Number two, I'm using a single pour. Is there anything wrong with keeping my mix at 350 for an extended period of time on a burner? And three, do you preheat your injection mold before injecting? Dun, dun, dun. Choose your own vector. So I can only answer one? Eh, well, we'll start with one. We'll see where it goes. Okay. You know what? <clears throat> We're going to do the should I keep my plastic hot? during the process all right um i wouldn't put it in a burner yeah or or, or, or excuse me i would not put it on a burner okay. if you are do you know do, doing your open pour you know process and you're trying to wait on molds to preheat or wait for the next color to cook but you want to keep an already cooked cup hot yeah um i would actually recommend putting it in the microwave especially if you have a second microwave and you keep it on defrost, which okay. just keeps it hot, right? Um, if you set that cup on a burner, it's it's never going to transfer that heat all the way to the top evenly. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think you're just going to be frustrated. So I, I would say 
if you are preheating your molds correctly, and I just did a video on this, on, on how to preheat to proper temperature for open pouring in aluminum. If you really are preheating your molds correctly, you're not rushed for time. You, you, don't, you don't need to, to have all your colors mixed at once and pour in the belly, pour in the next layer, pour in the next layer. You've got time because your molds are at proper temperature. So I literally, I run one teeny microwave for everything. Hmm. It, I, I, I think you're much better off refining your process than I need to keep cups of plastic ready to go hot for extended periods of time. I think if you're needing to do that, you need to do a little bit more work on, on, on your process. Okay. Yeah. Speaking of your process, I was, look, I was yeah. watching one of your videos and yeah. I saw something that <laughs> I loved. It was a pneumatic air vice because I have, I probably Thanks have seven or eight molds and mm -hmm. I, I, I hate putting them in my vice and all that stuff. So I saw what you had. It yeah. was a little, it was priced out of where it was priced over what I could pay. So I actually, sure. I am really close to having a DIY pneumatic air vice video coming out. Wonderful. Um, I know. So if you're interested in that, I'll show you how to make one. Yeah. All that jazz. But I say all that to um, walk us through because you have a pneumatic air vice. You have this shooting star. You have cooling plates. You have heating plates. Like all these things. Yes, you don't necessarily. You can hack in other ways. Yeah, but I'm really curious on I, I, what they do. I've seen them really shortly in videos, but I haven't seen you really explain them in detail. So walk us through this. Yeah, so so I the pneumatic air vice, you know, when, whenever I did the video kind of launch for it. Now, obviously, I was not the first bait maker to have a pneumatic air vice. You know, those have been around, and I once I started doing the the, the YouTube channel doing high volume production injection was no longer my goal. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm not the authority on shooting a thousand baits per 10 minutes, you know, like right. I've, I've, yeah, just, I, I, I stopped doing that to do content creation. You know, I, I, I used to run pretty high inject, a uh, high volume injection, but that was before pneumatic vices were even a thing. Right. Um, that's how long I've been doing this. So, um, you know, that that is purely for what I would say, high efficiency in, injection. OK, you can line up. I, let's see. I think mine is 24 inch frame. You know, you can get some that are 48. I mean, oh, yeah, you, I made mine you, long. you can you can literally line up. Thousands of dollars worth of molds, get out your Mondo injector or or, or your shooting star and just run them and you've got hundreds of cavities filled in minutes and that's what that's what your pneumatic vice is for is is so that you get no flashing in your injection molds i mean you're getting high psi clamping across dozens of molds at once Crazy. um it's a beautiful thing man you know whenever i do get it out i'm just like this is so awesome like None of my molds are going to tip over. I don't no. have to sit there and play with the little screws and bolts and wing nut for each individual <laughs> yep. one. Yep. I press a button and I can literally <laughs> lean on that injector and they're not going to flash, buddy. Like it's, it's amazing and it's safe and it's efficient. It is the best thing to ever happen to injection. Now, me personally, I've never owned a shooting star. Um, I always just ran Presto pots. A shooting star is basically cooking pots with internal stirs. And then an injector block system that draws directly from the bottom of the pots. Right. So a shooting star is basically two cooking pots with an injector block that stays hot so it doesn't ever gum up. And right. so what that does is that just saves you time. You know, so a shooting star is absolutely the best tool for the person who is serious about volume injection yep. without going to a Zorn machine or, you know, some hundred cavity count production mold um the you know the the shooting star is absolutely incredible but if you're going to be running that kind of volume you you absolutely want the real deal vice um there's there's really nothing like it yeah um but you know me, me personally i i never invested in a shooting star um they were around whenever i started land is the limit and, and was trying to do volume injection 
I just didn't really get there. Um, and back in those days, investment wise, um, that, that would have been smart, but I, I'm actually fortunate that I, I didn't wind up doing that. Um, I, I think I, I took a different direction and it, and it's gone really well. Um, so, um, you know, a, another thing, and, and this is something that I actually helped develop was, was the, the hot plate here. You can yeah. see mine actually is personally branded. It's so cool, man. Like, like Kyle does an awesome job. <laughs> and so, you know, the, the, the guy who makes this made my pneumatic vice it's right. a company called fishing all out. And I mean, this is truly a first of its kind. It is a cooking griddle on steroids. I mean, it, it has a heating blanket that heats the entire plate evenly because one, one problem that you have when you're heating up a bunch of open pour molds, some molds get hotter than others, hot spots. Um, and, and, and they warp They're they're, they're not, they're not completely a flat machined, you mm -hmm. know, piece of aluminum. This is, it can be leveled. It heats evenly and it has a very accurate pit controller. Wow. Um, you know, now, how, however, this is custom made the heat, the heat blanket itself is several hundred dollars just for the cost, you know, so it's, it's a very expensive piece of equipment. But it's an absolute game changer for the serious hand pourer. Um, this this has taken my hand pouring to to a, a level that I don't think I would quite be at with your traditional pancake griddles. Yep. You know, some of that is just how dedicated are you? You know, yeah. like I, I still feel like I would be pretty good at this because that's what I've practiced the most. But this right here solves a lot of problems. Um, <laughs> And, and, and you make, get the right it, tool. Yeah, it's it's a tool to make your process just that much better. You know, it's not a substitute for talent. It's not a substitute for you know time spent practice. It's just the right tool for the job. Yeah, hundred yeah. uh, percent. God, I'm gonna switch. I'm gonna switch gears on you because I had a question that I wanted to share with you. Sorry. Yes, and it was. For, for those, because I've seen this a lot, right? A lot of people are like, they get excited. They make their first bait. They're like, oh, yeah. I, can make, I can make a run at this. And ev everybody and their mom seems like is selling custom baits. Right. Yeah. So, and you had a video on it. I didn't watch it on purpose because I wanted to ask you the question. Yeah. What would be your advice? And what is the state of fishing lures? If yeah. your advice to someone who's thinking about this, right. like maybe measured expectations going into it because you've been in it for a while. Yeah. So, um, wow. Yeah. What, what a question, right? It was loaded, right? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I get that one a lot. And in fact, there's like five people that I need to respond to right now, uh, <laughs> literally asking this question in DMs is, Hey, I started making soft baits. Some friends of mine were interested in them. I want to start selling them. What advice do you have? Yep. My advice is to stop worrying right now as a beginner about how to sell more baits. Okay. Hmm. My advice is to practice, get good. Okay. You, you need to be able to offer a product that is incredibly well-made. Okay. Because it's very saturated now. and if there's one thing that people I think need to know is you have to dedicate every single day of your life to working social media. Okay. That's where all the action is. Okay. If, 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 if somebody comes to me and says, Hey, like I'm thinking about building a website, right. For my bait business, I would caution them to put their time, energy and resources into just building your social media page. That's where the action is. That's right. where everyone goes to, to consume content and to consume advertising, right? Sure. So I I had a beautiful website, man. So like my, uh, my Land is the Limit website was gorgeous. Okay, my sister, one of the most talented graphic designers you will ever see, we built a beautiful commerce website back in like 2014 okay. for, for my bait company. I no longer have it. I no longer need it. I no longer need to sit there and mess with a WordPress and commerce and all this stuff. 
I no longer need need to pay for a domain. Um, that has been made irrelevant for me, at least. Sure. Through social media, ninety nine point nine percent of every of all babes that I have sold since I started this YouTube channel was somebody contacting me on YouTube, yep. contacting me on Facebook, contacting mm -hmm. me through Instagram. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so I chose to put all my eggs into the social media basket. And here I am six, seven years later. That's what it takes. Like it, it truly takes years yep. of daily dedication. Now I may not post content every day. Okay. That doesn't mean that I'm not working social media every day. Mm -hmm. Part of that is seeing what other people are doing, right? Part of it is responding to comments, responding to DMs. I, I offer a very personal buying experience. So if, if somebody sees some baits that I posted on a Facebook page, like, like bass fishing fanatics yeah. or, you know, some of the lure making pages and they leave a comment, Hey man, would love some of these, you know, like, let me know like what these swim baits cost. I'll then immediately send them a direct message. Okay. And what I'll do is instead of just sending them a price for the baits. Yeah. Nah, ask questions. Okay. So I put a lot of work and a lot of time into getting one sale. Okay. So if anyone shows any interest in a product of mine, I will send them a, a direct message and I'll ask a question. Hey, Saw you were interested in the baits. What kind, what size bait and what patterns, what colors, which is what I mean by patterns. Sure. Are you looking for what types of colors do you normally throw? Or, or I'll ask, you know, like what if, so if somebody comments on like a picture of some of my shads, I'll, I'll say, Hey, saw you were interested in the baits. Um, what kind of shad patterns? Do you, do you like to fish or what, what do the shad in your local lake look like? And I'll just start a conversation. Right. And generally they'll, they'll hit me back with, Hey man, awesome looking stuff. You know, I'm, I'm looking for a, a, a bait in the four to five inch size or, you know, six inch size. And I really like this color you do, but can you send me some pictures of some other colors that you have? So I'll send them a snapshot and generally there's something in there that matches what they're looking for sure. or it gets really close to what they're looking for. And then we'll just go from there, you know, and it, it is literally just my way of just connecting with the customer. Right. I'm asking questions. I'm letting them tell me what they're looking for instead of me just saying, Hey man, here's a price for those swim baits. Take it or leave it. No, I'm, I, you know, my secret sauce is I'm selling myself. Yeah. I'm selling I'm selling my reputation as the YouTube guy. I'm selling my reputation as one of the leading hand pourers, um, one of the leading soft bait guys. And people have a lot of confidence, I think, when they buy from me that they're going to get what they are asking for. And I'm not going to scam them. And it's going to be the quality that they expect from somebody who's spent years building their reputation. And so my advice to somebody starting out is offer that experience. Your ace in the hole as a custom bait maker is the ability to connect with the customer mm. and offer them a buying experience that they cannot get off a shelf. You cannot get it. Even if your product is not up to par with what they're buying on the shelf, your, your buying experience can be, and it mm. can be better. And you can offer them sort of what they come to know as, Hey, I got this guy who can make anything right. You know, or, or I, I got this guy who, who can make you that bait that you want. And so that's how you get repeat business. You know, you get repeat business by selling yourself more than, more than your bait does. Um, so in a nutshell, work social media every day of your life, dedicate years of time to it and don't expect success overnight. I didn't have success overnight. I started my bait company in 2012, then in 2015, had to stop. I had to get a job, you know? I mean, mm. li life, life comes at you. I wanted to marry my girlfriend at the time. Um, I had to get a job. So I didn't make baits for two years. Mm. The only reason I started making baits again 
was when I made that first bait video on YouTube. I was yeah. in my mind, I was done with my bait company. Huh. It was my YouTube success that fired it back up again. So you know, as yeah. a professional fundraiser, um, yeah, I do for a living. Yeah, you know, and, and, and there again, it's it's e it's it's easy for me to to say, yeah, you know, like just get just get famous on YouTube and then you get sales. That's not everybody's story, right? The 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 majority of bait makers are not gonna be or are not gonna become known for it on YouTube. You know, there's a lot of YouTube channels now doing soft baits. Yep. There's a lot of YouTube channels doing almost exactly a lot of the same things that I'm doing on YouTube who have started in the last few years. They do a great job. They're building an audience, but they're never going to be first to market, right? Like there, there's there's something to be said about the person who kind of did it first. And there again, I was not the first person to do soft baits on YouTube. Sure. I was the first channel, I think, to dedicate to soft baits and to soft bait education mm. and to really spilling every bit of knowledge that I had. Um, yeah. the, the only other channel who was doing that was, was that guy Skimpy. Um, however, he did a lot of different stuff. Like he did everything from soft baits to wire baits, spinner baits, um, a, a lot of different things. I I'm, I'm pretty confident. I was the first guy to really drill in to just my area of expertise, which was soft baits. Yeah. And that has led to a large following, which turned into a large customer base. However, I still have to. It, well, well, not necessarily have to, but I still choose to go out of my way to make a sale, ask questions, get on a personal level with the customer and try to be as responsive as you can, because that's what sets you apart from baits hanging on a shelf at the store that nobody has any sort of connection to, to you as a custom bait maker. Yeah. Pra practice, get good. Don't worry about sales at first. Work social media till you're blue in the face. And part of working social media is working the customer. Talk to them, ask them questions, let them tell you what they want. Okay. So like if if you uh if you were to watch interviews from like um the Wolf of Wall Street guy, right? Uh what's his name? Jordan <clears throat> Jordan Belfort, you know, okay. he was a complete, you know, slimy dude, but he understood how to sell. Right. And how to sell is to create a relationship and ask questions. Don't quote a price. Don't say, hey, here's what I'm selling and here's what it costs. Ask them questions. Because if there's one thing people like, they like to talk about themselves. Hey. We all like to talk about ourselves. And if you can get an angler to talk about what kind of baits they like to throw, they'll start to get excited. And boom, now you know what their needs are and if you can match it or not. So. Yeah. That's a long-winded answer to my. No, it's great. Yeah. So for those of you who came in like partially way, I was asking him what is yeah. the advice that you give to someone who may be thinking about starting a bait company. And here's the thing: as a professional fundraiser, that's what I do. That's what I've been doing for the past 15 years. You have to be more interested than interesting in yeah. connecting people in a meaningful way. There, I, yeah. I work with major donors all over the country. They, there's there's thousands upon thousands of nonprofits they can give to. <laughs> It's my yeah. job to make sure they're connected in a meaningful way to the one and kind of brokering mm -hmm. that relationship and say exactly what you're talking about here. Um, yeah. So I think it's key. A lot of people want that instant sale. The, the, the success in their minds is the dollar bills and their bank accounts. Yeah. And you will, you will crash and burn if that is your goal right off the bat. Um, yeah. You know, and, and, and obviously look, Money matters, you know, like you, you will not be able to buy that next cup of, uh, uh, well, excuse me, that, that next bucket of plastic, you will not be able to afford 10 more cavities of your favorite mold unless you have the money to do so. Right. And maybe you had, you know, you know, some, some really good initial capital to invest, but you know, look, I mean, look at, at the end of the day, yes, you do have to sell baits. However, I think if you want that repeat business, if you want long-term success as a small garage bait maker, right? I, I I would say, look, your pathway to that is social media and your ace in the hole is your ability to connect with the customer. You can offer a buying experience that the most successful bait in the world 
cannot compete with. Y Yamamoto Cinco's cannot compete with the buying experience of you. And so you are your greatest asset. You can practice and refine your craft to a level that the store-bought baits cannot compete with, and you can offer a better buying experience. And that just comes from dedication. Get on social media and look at what everyone else is doing and try to try to learn and say, okay, how are they creating a buzz? You know, and, and look, social media is more difficult now than it was yeah. even two, three yeah. years ago. Algorithms change. My engagement on my average Instagram post is less than half what it was two years ago. And my content is better. My colors are better. My pictures are better. My product is better. Engagement is down. Engagement is down on my YouTube channel. The algorithm has never been the same since COVID. Um, you know, for whatever reason, things are just more difficult um, yeah. on social media. And, you know, that could really discourage me, but I try not to let it, you know? So if I was starting now on social media, whoa, you know, like golly, I, I'm really up against the wall. Um, you know, that, that golden era for me, you know, is, is now a few years in the past. Yeah, I mean, th there was one year I I gained like forty thousand subs in in like one year. Yeah. Um, you know now now I'm at about ten thousand subs a year. Like I I think last year I did ten eleven thousand subs on YouTube for the whole year, and that's not necessarily me getting worse at YouTube. That's the algorithm changing, and yeah. the fact that YouTube is now more saturated with bait makers. Right. There's yeah. there's 30 people trying to do what I'm doing. Um, and just the initial, you know, Hey, you got to see this wears off over time. You know, like I'm my, my style of content is no longer new. It was four years ago. Right. It's, it's not necessarily new anymore. And so, you know, I, I have to try to, you know, just stay the course, you know, I, I, I guess so. Um, but, but in terms of sales, if somebody's trying to start a business, your best asset is you. And I know that sounds cliche, but you you really have to dedicate yourself to social media. That is where all the action is at. Everyone's on TikTok. Everyone's on Instagram. Everyone's on YouTube. If you're just trying to build a commerce website, you're, I, yeah, no. Good luck. Let's put a good Don't luck. do it. I'll Don't do it. Gears. I'll switch gears on you. Yeah. Because uh, we're toward the end of our time. If you have yeah. a question... For Chris, world's worst. Yeah, hit, hit me, guys. Yeah, throw that in there. We have a couple here. I'm gonna give you a choose your own adventure again. Okay. Um, we have TJ Fishing asking, "What's the ideal microwave wattage?" So that's interesting. Then right. Brandon says, "Not sure if you got this answered, but do you need to preheat the injection molds? Injection." And then Sly Fox. If someone was asked for 20 custom designed swim baits, what would the average cost be? 20 custom. Um, I think the same kind. So it's like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So like he's talking about like a set of 20 baits. Yeah. Swim baits. So for me, um, boy, you know, uh, so me, for example, whenever I sell my swim baits, I sell them per the cavity count that I have in the mold. Okay. Okay. So, for example, Angling AI Molds just released the G6 swim bait. It's um, this one right here. It's the one that I showed earlier. It's a six inch swim bait, and this is what the mold cavity looks like. Mm -hmm. So, if you wanted a set of these, the G6s, I pour them by the set of a dozen, okay? Not 20. If you yeah, wanted 20, mold. that would be, you know, <laughs> obviously something that we could work out. But, you know, my base price for like a set of 12 of these. In, in my more generic colors, would range between $65, $70 for a set. If you wanted something crazy, um, hey, you know, it's going to be more. I mean, some some colors just require double, triple your work time. Mm. And time is money. Yeah. Um, preheating injection molds. Some molds do shoot better hot. Okay. Um, however, Generally speaking, no. Um, 
I never preheat my injection molds. Okay. So no matter what mold I'm shooting, um, I'm not going to like put them on the hot plate ahead of time. And, and maybe unless it's like one of those rare days here in Florida where it's like 30 degrees during the day, not the low at night, but like the daytime, if it's 30 degrees, things don't work well when they're cold. You know I mean? You're, you're, you're trying to shoot 350 degree plastic into molds that are going to cool that plastic really fast. And that creates too much shrinkage, which creates dents in your baits. And it can plug up your injector before you're finished with the injection process. Yeah. Or my man, is my hair look this bad the whole time? Yeah, um, so yeah, you know, preheating can help um, get rid of dents. Okay. Mm -hmm. In an injection mold, but generally speaking, none of your injection molds are going to require preheating. And in fact, once you get a few rounds done, the molds are going to be hot. Yeah. And you're, <laughs> I mean, yeah, you're, 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 you're almost good to go no matter what. Um, so me personally, no, if I was up North when I'm out there in zero degrees, yeah, I'm, I'm preheating my injectors and I'm preheating my injection molds simply for the purpose of just getting the whole cavity to fill. Because if your mold is that cold yeah, and you, and you tried to push that hot plastic in, generally speaking, some of the little like small extremities probably won't fill. So. Cause they'll cool off faster. Than they can fill up the cabinet. That that okay. plastic man sets up yeah. like that, even in normal climate. So, um, yeah, if, 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 if the aluminum was literally zero degrees, I would preheat it. hundred percent. That's, that's where it's at up here in Canton. Like I'll go out yeah. there. I'll turn the heat on in my garage, but those molds are still. Yeah. She's like, I'm, I'm in a jacket and I'm burning up right now. You know, <laughs> yeah. burning up out here. Um, yeah. we had a couple other questions over here. Yeah, yeah, please. Let me see, we had a oh, is there an ideal microwave wattage, or it doesn't matter because you just gotta get used to your particular no. Microwave. Um I choose to have my little <clears throat> tiny microwave, yeah, because it doesn't take up much space. Um I'm not too concerned, you know, because I'm not trying to heat up large quantities of plastic at once, you know, four measuring cups at once or half a gallon at once. I'm not too concerned with some giant 1200 watt microwave. I have like just a little countertop size, 700 watt. Most of the time I'm heating up one to two cups at a time. Got it. And what I find is the lower the wattage, the less likely you are to accidentally burn your plastic or scorch it. So okay. I rather heat it for longer and keep the quality of my plastic high then accidentally degrade it okay because a lot of the a lot of the colors that i'm making you know some of the shad patterns i really need my plastic to look good i need it to be clear i need it to be see-through and i needed to not have like a yellow or green tint to it so mm -hmm. i i really don't want my plastic to be even slightly overheated i really need to nail it every time and slow and steady always wins the race. There you always. go. So always. you would recommend a lower wattage just to a, low, a lower wattage if you just want to make a little bit of stuff at a time. Yeah. And you want less burns. All right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I got a couple more questions over here. One, just to let you know, Caro, thanks. Your hair just looks Whoops. just fine. Sorry, yeah. guys. Um, hair looks good from Caro. So good to go there. Yeah. Um, pick your own venture. Got a few questions here. They're coming in pretty fast, so we won't, won't get to all of them. Yeah. Land of Bait says, uh, what is like what's the most requested color? That's one. Number two, Mike Van Winkle says, I have trouble making much of a profit because of the cost of shipping. How do you ship out your bakes to make that profit? Um, and then the third question is here: what is the best way to preheat your injector itself, your heat gun? Okay, so the best way to preheat your injector <clears throat> is to put it on a griddle. Okay, so uh, George Foreman. Yep. Mm -hmm. Or 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 just a pancake griddle. Um, so any of us open pour guys, we already have a pancake griddle, or we have you know the the big fancy hot plate, or we have maybe even like a commercial cooking plate, like you would see at a uh, at a restaurant kitchen, um, which you know are a little bit more accurate. So. Literally, just like I have here in the background, see my injector sitting on the hot plate. 
There you go. Do that. You know, um, that that is how I would do that. Um, let's see. Uh, one of the other uh, let's see. What, what what were the other two questions again? Um, shipping and most shipping. requested color. Okay, so my profit. yeah, so my most requested color. Um, and this is speaking to the baits that I sell, so my, mainly swim baits, is absolutely my hickory shad color. Okay. Um, which a couple videos ago, I show the exact recipe, so please take it and roll with it. Um, <laughs> That's I, kind of you. It's Very incredible. Kind. It's incredible how much I give away the farm. Um, <laughs> Welcome to YouTube. Yeah, my, yeah. Um, let's see. Okay, so shipping cost. All right, so all of my transactions, are through PayPal, okay? And PayPal is partnered with ShipStation. And so what I recommend doing, um, there again, my average package is a pound or less, okay? Okay. Um, so like if, if somebody's, uh, like if somebody buys a set of 14 five-inch swim baits, okay? I know that weighs exactly 12.1 ounces, okay? So I would put those in a bubble mailer, and that's going to cost me about four eighty five to ship anywhere in continental United States. Yeah. Now something like extremely rural, like Lubbock, Texas, or something, or something way out in the middle of Arizona, it's going to cost me a little over five dollars. Well, look, you pass that cost on to the customer. Sure. So whenever I invoice somebody for a sixty dollars set of swim baits or a seventy dollars set of swim baits, they get an invoice for seventy five dollars. Right? I mean. You you should never um, really eat the cost of shipping. That that's the customer's job. So I, I have a huge order going out to France soon. Uh -huh. An entire medium flat rate box going to France. It's oh, going to cost geez. like sixty dollars USD, <laughs> and I'm not paying a dime of that. Um, sure. Hold on a second. I got to go cut my water heater clicker off. Yeah, hold on. It's making a lot of noise. Oh yeah, I kind of hear. I kind of hear flat. that. It's all good. I'm looking at all the other questions coming in. So have a, have a, get your last minute questions yeah. in and yeah. we'll, we will try to answer those. All right. Yeah. So, so, um, yeah, you know, in, in, in terms of losing money on shipping, um, it's still clicking. I, I hope y'all can hear that, but it's not it, you know, in, in terms of losing money on shipping, pass the shipping cost along to the customer. I mean, always factor that into your price. Always. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and as a bait maker, you have to pay a 10% quarterly excise tax to the federal government because taxes and reasons. So always factor that in, you know, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I just had to give 10% of my business away the other day, literally at the end of January, because you have to pay a federal excise tax. So, um, always think of these things ahead of time. So, you know, there, there's there's no reason for you to be losing money on shipping. I think everyone who buys goods and services online is used to paying for shipping. Sure. If I buy something on Amazon, yeah, Amazon Prime gives you that free shipping, right? You think that's not factored into the cost of the item? Yeah, it is. 100%. Yeah, I offer free you're not you're not hand. getting free shipping. You're just <laughs> not getting an extra shipping charge. Exactly. So, um, <clears throat> nothing's free ever. So. Factor that into your pricing. A $70 yeah. set of swim baits for me is $75 at the end of the day. However, that $5, I got to pay to the to the post office, you know? And, and likely, it's maybe even a little bit more than $5. I just choose to do a flat $5 because it's just, it's easy on my books. So, yeah, yeah. Okay. I may, I may lose a few pennies, but whatever. Yeah, it makes it easy. All right, well, I'll, the final final questions here. If you have some, get them in because we're getting ready. Yeah, we're we supposed plane. to go an hour. Well, I get an hour forty. <laughs> uh, are you good? If you're good, I'm good to keep I'm rolling. Good. All right, we're we're landing the plane. Yeah, I can't believe it's almost. That. <laughs> I mean, we still have 180 people on, so it's really hard to show. Yeah, this great, down. great. If you yeah, haven't great. done so, great. hit that like button. Help us get a little extra yardage on this thing. Um, yeah, after it's all said and done. I got another choose your own adventure because there's so many questions coming in. Um, okay. Four of them for you. How do you keep your colors consistent from said Walker? Okay. Do you, do you pour for any pros? You might not be able to answer that. Okay. Is using a vacuum chain chamber a must when pouring plastic? And 
Have you ever shot a bait with rattles in it? I have not shot a bait with rattles in it. I have considered it many times. Um, Next video. Here it comes. Yeah, it, it, it just hasn't been anything that's ever been requested for me. Um, I've wanted to do it just for YouTube sure. content purposes. Like, hey, here's something that you can do. Yeah. Um, I'm certainly not the first to that. But, yeah, you know what? That, that does sound really interesting. Uh, you know, it's it's nothing more than just putting it in the mold and injecting the plastic over it. Um, now, some molds are actually made with a slot in the cavity to put a rattle in. Uh, all you know, right. Um, <clears throat> you know, that way the rattle stays in place. Um, however, you know, it's just something that hasn't really been requested. Um, I do not pour for any pros. No. All of my custom of. all of my customers are um weekend warriors who just want a uh, I, I think uh well what I hope is a really high quality bait. Yeah. Um, um, you know, I've I've sold to, you know, some former NBA players and uh, you know. But That's you know, cool. in, in in terms of like marquee anglers. No, actually, um, I would, I would love to, I think I could show them some stuff they've never seen before, you mm -hmm. know, with, without trying to sound arrogant. I think I can pour some stuff that not many people can do. So I would, I would love to, to see what, what, that, what somebody who really knows how to fish can, can do with, with what I think is some of my best work. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I would say the only, I've made baits with pros with Terry Scroggins. But I don't. I don't currently sell any of my high end hand pours to anyone that I would consider on the like the the upper professional level. Circuit. All right. Um, interesting. Uh, vacuum chamber. Vacuum chamber. It's an absolute must if you are pouring any sort of decent shad colors. Okay. Okay. Um, if if you want to at all at all even approach something that is largely see through like this. Now, obviously. Mm. You cannot see this color for what it is. This looks terrible on this video. <laughs> on it is absolute sexy in person. You you absolutely cannot achieve certain results without a vacuum chamber. Even even the freshest plastic, fresh from the factory, mm. delivered on your doorstep that day that does not have any moisture contamination from humidity, you're still not going to get what you can get with a vacuum chamber. And that is if you are truly trying to make colors that utilize clear and low saturation with pearls. If I'm just making June bug, watermelon red, you know, um, some of your more standard solid colors, it's not so important. You know, wait a few minutes and any bubbles that you stir in or any bubbles that may come from the cooking process as the resin converts are going to work themselves out. Just, just like, just like bubbles in a cup of water, they're all going to come to the top. Yeah. So, so what's, um, that, what's the vacuum chamber do for the none of us who are like, hey, I don't typically, yeah, have a vacuum yeah, so, chamber. So a, a vacuum pot. chamber, a vacuum chamber literally just creates a vacuum in a pot, and it basically removes the air, right, from the entire area, which in turn pulls any air out of the plastic. And it even can pull moisture out of the resin and the plastic. Uh -huh. So a little, a little known fact about a vacuum chamber, it will, it will actually cure your plastic of any moisture that has been absorbed into the resin. So the actual resin itself in your plastisol, sort of like salt, is what's pulling moisture in. So here in hot, humid Florida, there are days I walk out here and there are, there is literally moisture on my molds like my molds are wet almost like they're sweating wow so any bucket of plastic that i have where the seal has been broken so basically if i've even opened it once is now susceptible to that and right. just temperature changes create condensation that all gets absorbed <clears throat> into the resin which creates moisture problems your vacuum pot can take the air out and right. actually take the moisture out it's incredible it's incredible i love it yeah. All right. And 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 they're cheap, like $150 for a kit. So that's not bad. It's really not. Huh. It'll pay for itself in a day or two if 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 you're selling a lot. So it's 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 really nothing. Yeah. I love it.
All right. Well, we we're coming down to the final. Yeah. All those questions. Everyone's like, hey, um, Ace Universe One's like, hey, I'm good. Enjoying the combos. Fast rap. Thank you. Like, hey, I'm enjoying it. There we go. Hey, if y'all want to see more, check out some of my videos. You'll uh, you'll you'll get all you want. I promise. So <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, yeah. folks, if you haven't done so yet, please hit that like button. Mm. Uh, hopefully, I've earned your sub if you haven't done that yet. Um, yes, also, yes. For those to all my viewers, in, please head over. Yes, please. Both, both, please. both ways. This is mm -hmm. uh, please incredible yeah. community out there. Next yeah. week, we don't have a show. However, the following week, I got Brown Bait Company on. So this right is right on. Like, yeah, yeah. Hard baits. So we're going yeah. from soft baits to hard baits, and we're yeah. going to take a deep dive into that. Yeah. Uh, man oh yeah i have dabbled in that a little bit you know the, the airbrush is super fun so yeah you know and you know even even some custom wood carving it's it's very fun it's it's all fun i mean even even pouring lead jigs is fun yeah and to me that's not near as exciting as soft baits but <laughs> it's all great so yeah any oh. anything is yeah yeah it's it's all great you know it's a way to kind of it's like arts and crafts for like adult outdoorsmen, you know, I mean, I was not artistically inclined when I was young. Yeah. Um, and, and in fact, I was very musically inclined. I picked up drums really well. I was a drummer at a pretty high level for a long time. Um, colors and arts and being able to draw. No, I still can't write legibly much less can I paint you something or draw you something, but I was able to find, you know, an, uh, an untapped resource in my mind with soft baits, you know? So yeah. it's just, it's just one of those things you never know if you're going to really knock it out of the park or not. You know, so My, was, my wife was, recently was like, Hey, why, why is there so many, so much, why are you buying so much glitter? I never thought in a million years, my husband would be buying so, oh. <laughs> so much glitter. Yeah, <laughs> it's everywhere. It's all over. Yeah, my I've, I've got quite the glitter collection. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like uh, well, ten well, years worth. So that's yeah. awesome. Awesome. Uh, well, I have to have you on the show some uh, again sometime in please, the future because I, don't, I feel yeah. like we just scratched the surface. We have only scratched. We have only scratched the surface. We can even get on here and I'll do a live pouring session. That's um, what I'm talking about. Yeah, I'm I mean, about. there's there's a lot. There's a lot more to this iceberg than just the tip. I mean, I I I have over 400 videos, and I feel like there's so much more to accomplish. So, um, it's it's like it's like any other area of passion or expression. You're never finished, you know. Yeah. Um, I mean, even even the most accomplished drummers in the world that I follow, they're not they're not content with where they're at. You know, there's still something else that you have never played. There's still another layer of rhythm or another polymetric structure or another lick or fill that has never been done before. So, you know, there's there's an unlimited resource pool to pull from from just nature alone. Yeah. I mean, just looking at bluegills and species of shad and forage fish, um, you know, snakes and, and you know, lizards and all, all, all these different, you know, crawfish. All these different things that bass and, and and that's just bass you know all these different things that that fish eat there's so much inspiration there mm. to pull from in terms of how can i manifest this color or this color profile or pattern into into a bait you're never going to run out of ideas just from nature alone yeah. so it is truly never ending i for for all of the things that I've done, and I feel like I've done a lot now in soft baits, hundred times more than I haven't done. So love it. We're gonna get there though. I promise. I love it. Well, yeah. folks, thanks for listening in. I know we went over time, hour and forty five. Usually I go a little over an hour. But hey, when, yeah, when, that's my when you're bringing time. the bringing the heat like you were bringing it tonight. Yeah, um, it, yeah. It's ten o'clock. It's over past ten o'clock here on the East Coast, yeah, and um. That is that is late for me, man. I am I am an old I'm an old tired parent, you know. I hear so. you. I got to go edit this thing now, so I'm not even going to bed for like another hour. So yeah. Uh, oh, so so quick quick question. Yeah. Since I'm live streaming this on my YouTube channel, will it be like on my YouTube channel it after will. we're done? Okay, great. Yeah, because yeah, I don't I don't necessarily need to edit it. 
I, I no, don't think for good. my purposes. So yeah, I edit mine for the podcast, so I got to do Wonderful. the audio. I yeah. got the podcast. So hey, if okay, you guys great. are yeah. interested in the podcast, that if you're like, hey, I don't always get to make it to the live. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Love it. Yeah. All excellent. right. Well, no podcast, no, no kayak fishing obsessed show next week, but I'll see you on the 20th for Brown Bait Company. Thank you so much yeah. um, for yeah. th- your time and everything. I, I'm getting a ton of people already saying, hey, awesome, 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 awesome. Yeah. Well, hey, hey, guys, thanks for tuning in. You know, I, this, this was a, a pretty good, I think, um, in depth look at what I do and just the soft plastic hobby in general. Um, there's a lot more to unpack. So anytime y'all want me back on, please, please, please let him know. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'll, I'll definitely be, definitely be, uh, you know, willing to come back on. I mean, you, you, you have to remember the conversation that you and I have had tonight on here. Yeah. I have several times a week with people that it's just not recorded, you know? Sure. So yeah, I, I do this all the time. So I love it. All right, folks, you have a good, good night and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. Chris, yeah. have a good one, brother. Yeah. See you, everybody.